Hello. So in this video, I'm going to talk about two ways that the legal system is actually bad for divorce. So stay tuned. Welcome to Wellness with John. I'm John Peters, and these are resources to help you thrive. This video is part of a sequence that I'm doing on co-parenting after divorce. If you want to watch the whole playlist, I'll put the link for the playlist in the description below. So uh, why am I talking about this? If you don't know me, I'm a therapist. I've been in practice for 27 years. I've worked with thousands of parents as a therapist, a co-parent coach, a mediator. <clears throat> I also have taught over 250 live divorce workshops for several thousand parents, um, and I've written two books on the topic. So, so that's, that's why I'm talking to you about this today. Um, and one disclaimer that I want to get out there that, and be very clear about is I am speaking from my experience in those roles that I just mentioned. One role that I have never played and will never play is attorney. So this should not be construed as legal advice. This is just John's opinion on matters, some of which have to do with the legal system, okay? <clears throat> but get good legal advice from your actual attorney and uh, just think carefully considering the things that I'm going to share with you in this video, right? So why am I talking about the legal system if I'm not an attorney? Because in the thousands of cases that I've worked in, I have noticed some things that I think are very important for us to think about and for you to think about as you are navigating the divorce process, as you are navigating the legal divorce process and beyond. And um, so that's what I'm going to share. And in fact, I think that there are a couple of, of things that are good to think about in terms of why the legal system in the way it's set up and the way that parents interface with it actually create problems for parents who are going through the legal divorce process and parents who are separated. And one of the issues has to do with the lack of the ability of the court system and the justice system and the legal process to address some very legitimate concerns that parents have for kids and the needs that kids have in regard to being well supported through and after a divorce process. And what I'm talking about is just how the court views children and their various needs that exist before, during, and after a divorce. If you watched the video right before this one in this sequence, part of what I talked about was that there are limitations of what the court can and should do in a family. And this runs us up against needs versus what the court is going to do. Okay. And let me give you a little bit of history for this to make a little more sense. Okay. So, Way back in the early part of the legal system in the United States, children were considered legally just to be property. They were property in the same way that the tractor was property, or the land, the farm was property, the house is property, the boat is property. So for a long time in the legal system, children weren't considered in any more complex way than property, okay? And it was also true in the early part of our, our, the U.S. history that wives weren't allowed to own property that was acquired during a marriage, okay? That's changed today, but for decades and decades, any property, including children, that were acquired during the marriage, the legal marriage, at the time of the legal divorce, the father owned 100% of that property. That was just a feature of our legal system. So the question of who gets the kids from a legal standpoint was very cut and dried. Children are property. The father gets all the property. Therefore, the father gets the legal custody of the children. Okay. Now, in practice, did it really work that way? No. Um, but from a legal standpoint, mothers didn't have a leg to stand on. 
from a legal standpoint, making a case that they should own the children as property after the divorce. Okay. Now, when did that change and how? It changed a lot at the turn of the last century when you had Sigmund Freud and, and weirdos like Sigmund Freud starting to write about children not as property, but as little humans and little undeveloped humans. And so these notions that we have today about what human development is, like kids are born and they're immature and then they become more mature and they have certain needs while they're needing nurturance in order to grow and mature and develop into adults, that, that, that was not an idea that we really thought about as a society very clearly until the early 1900s. And so once people started thinking about children as little people with special needs as immature uh, non-adults, right, um, that then caused the legal system to adapt and to start to think about, well, when we're dealing with these divorce cases, it's not just that the children are property, but the children are these little people who have needs, and somehow divorces ought to point toward those needs in, in certain ways, right? Which is when you have the onset of, of more detailed kinds of ideas, like what, what is the parenting time schedule going to be after the divorce, right? Who makes the decisions for the child after the divorce, right? You don't think about those concepts of scheduling and decision making if you just think about kids as property, right? But once we started thinking about kids have needs as immature adults, um, and they're not yet adults, and the parents have responsibilities to parent them, and divorce is about you know changing the dynamics of the family, then the legal divorces started to address that in different ways, right? Now, one of the outcomes of that which went on for decades, was that if you think about kids having needs, um, then what, what, what the courts tried to divine was um, who, which parent is best fit to serve those needs. And for a lot of history, and this is still actually somewhat true today, although fathers are much more involved today than they used to be, but when courts look, when a judge looked out over the bench at, at the mom and the dad and said, um, I'm trying to figure out how to set up this order so that it helps the kids get their needs met, a lot of the time the judges were, to the extent that they could figure that out or guess at it, what, what they were seeing was that young children are primarily getting their direct parenting from their mothers, Right. Now, this is not universally true. It wasn't in the beginning of time, and it's not true today. And if you're a dad and you're hearing this, you may think that I'm poo-pooing your role in your kid's early life. But the reality is, at the time that these types of decisions became very dominant in the legal system related to divorces, what judges were seeing was that mom was breastfeeding, mom was changing the diapers, Mom was feeding the kids in the evening, okay? And dad was going to work and coming home, okay? That's an overstatement, but that's kind of the type of picture that the judges were seeing. And so when the, when the judge was then trying to say, am I going to write an order that, that addresses the kids' needs, like getting them to school, getting them dressed, getting them fed and whatnot, they often would think, well, which parent is better set up to do that? It's mom. So this bias toward moms getting most of the parenting time and most of the decision making, aka custody, um, that got built into the, the legal system after we had these psychological theories about just what the heck are kids if they're not property and what needs do they have and to what degree do those needs need to be explicitly addressed in divorce decrees, okay? So for decades then, there was this bias of moms going to court and winning custody and dads having the perception with bases uh, that they were unfairly disadvantaged in the legal system in terms of making claims for significant portions of custody and parenting time. So that went on for decades. And then that evolved somewhat after this legal concept 
got popularized called the best interest of the child. So as, as I mentioned, first children are property, then they're little people who have special needs. And then people started zooming in on, well, what are those needs? And how can we best evaluate them and incorporate those evaluations into the legal process? And this, this legal concept came around called the best interest of the child. So it wasn't just who's the more fit parent. And it wasn't just, well, what does the kid need? But it tried to get more granular in zooming in for this particular kid, you know, John Smith as a particular boy whose parents are going through the legal divorce process. What does he need, right? So, for example, let's say that he is, is let's say he sucks at math and his dad is really good at math, but his mom is not. And so that particular boy's needs might be best addressed in part by loading up school nights at dad's house so dad can help him with his math homework, okay? So the best interest of the child is this legal concept that doesn't try to think about what do all kids need, what serves all kids' best interest, but zooms in on a particular kid and says, what does, what does this particular kid need, okay? So, so that's what the best interest of the child tries to do. And, you know, to some degree, I think it makes some divorce decrees more competent. But I think part of the problem with that concept is that it, it, it makes it hard for judges and attorneys who are not experts in the types of things that people like me work in to figure out what the best interests are, right? Now they reach out to experts like me. People sometimes get custody evaluations, and I'm going to make a video where I talk about custody evaluations, but that's another way that people try to introduce the particulars of what the best interest of a particular child might be. Uh, judges sometimes uh, appoint what's called a special advocate, court-appointed special advocate or a guardian ad litem in order to try to divine what the needs of a particular child might be. But at the end of the day, it's really hard for the legal system to define the whole comprehensive world of of needs that need to get addressed for a particular kid. And, and I think this is one of the limitations, you know, of the legal system to address a kid's needs. Now, do the kid's needs need to be addressed? Of course. Can we rely on the legal system to do that for us and to best support that in happening? No. Because even if we divine it and it's in the decree, if parents are fighting about it, is the judge going to send someone to your house to make dad do the math homework with the kid or something like that? I mean, again, in the last video, I was talking about informal agreements. Those need to be made as robust as you can through civil negotiation and forthright agreement. But if you rely on the legal system to satisfy all of your kid's needs, a, it can't, and B, that's a recipe for endless fighting in court, okay? And in fact, in the United States, if you look at uh, people who start the legal divorce process, um, one-third are still fighting in court at the four-year mark. And at the five-year mark, after the first filing, um, a quarter of parents are still fighting. So... So five years out from filing for divorce, one out of every four parents are still fighting in the courts. And most of those parents are in there fighting because they're asking the court to do something that the court just can't do, okay? Now, I'm not poo-pooing the whole legal system. I'm not arguing for us jettisoning the legal divorce process because it does play a supportive role in providing clarity and structure for what to do after the divorce. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what I'm saying, the so what of this is that there are limitations. Okay. There's some things that the court can't do for you. Right. So the other problem I want to talk about with the legal system in this video, problem number two, is that the court system is an adversarial process. It doesn't matter whether you're fighting over the kid or the custody or the boat or the house or the equity or the farm. There's a petitioner who's battling the defendant, okay? And it's an adversarial process. And it actually makes a lot of divorces worse from the standpoint of do parents 
co-parent in a civil, collaborative, effective way after separation? And do the kids in that family get their needs met? Unfortunately, court battles make a lot of that worse. And one of the ways that it makes it worse is if I'm party A and my daughter's mom is party B, basically, I think I'm going to win the case, whatever the elements I want to win around. I'm going to win to the extent that I prove to the court, I demonstrate to the court that she is an unfit parent. And my daughter's mom is going to go into court if we're battling about one or more elements. And to the extent she thinks she can prove to the court that I'm an unfit parent, she's going to win. Okay? That's the game. Okay? We're in dispute of issue X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to win to the extent I can show that my other parent is unfit. And, and why is this a bad thing? Because imagine I'm sitting in court, and imagine my ex-wife is sitting there, and she wants, let's say, sole custody, and I'm arguing for joint custody. So she wants to win the judge's favor to take her position that she gets sole custody. And her strategy to do that is to demonstrate that I'm unfit. And so she and her lawyer introduce all of this evidence to support the idea that I suck as a parent. I'm sitting there in the court watching someone demean my character, and they're doing what I call pushing the biggest button. What is the biggest button that can get pushed in a parent's brain? The biggest button is threatening a parent's relationship with their child, okay? So every bit of evidence my ex-wife might be introducing in that imaginary court hearing, every bit of evidence, everything she says, everything her lawyer says, is pushing the biggest button in me because it's, in my mind, threatening my relationship with my daughter. It's threatening my perception of my daughter's needs getting met. It's threatening my perception of my daughter's safety and fundamental well-being, okay? And every bit of evidence I introduce to say her mom sucks is pushing the biggest possible button inside her mom, okay? Now, regardless of how it ends, regardless of whether the judge rules in my favor or her favor, do you think we walk out of that hearing and have a big group hug and sing Kumbaya together and then proceed as civil, collaborative, friendly co-parents? Does that hearing help with that? It does not. Okay, you push the biggest button in the other parent's brain and that other parent is not going to be particularly happy to be civil with you, regardless of what you're trying to communicate and negotiate around. Now, again, you might say, John, doesn't that lead us back to you poo-pooing the whole legal system, legal process? No, Um, but I do think that you have to carefully consider the psychological effects of the legal process because you get to go home and live with that. The judge doesn't have to go home and live with your strife, okay? The judge just has to decide A or B, here's the order, okay? But the judge doesn't have to go home and live for the next days, months, years in a family full of turmoil because the parents can't be civil with each other, okay? And part of how parents become less civil with each other is battling over stupid stuff in court that they shouldn't even be in court in the first place, and even things that are legitimate, often alternative methods would be better. Which leads me to the answer of, if the court is inadequate and it's gonna fan the flames because we push each other's buttons, is there, what else could we do, right? One option is to go to mediation, okay? Mediation is not the same as arbitration where the mediator makes a decision for you, or court where the judge makes a decision for you. Mediation is where a mediator leads you through a process of attempting to come to satisfying mutual agreements around one or more issues. And I'll make a whole video on mediation later, but that's the bare bones idea about why mediation is. People who do mediated agreements are more satisfied with them later than people who do litigated litigated agreements in court, okay? Uh, There's research on that. Also, you also could do a collaborative divorce, right? And I'm not going to go too much into it because I'll make a video about this later, but there is collaborative law where basically you put up in escrow a certain amount of money 
and you go into a law practice where each of you has your own lawyer, but your lawyers are already agreeing to be as collaborative as possible, and you try to not go to court, and to the extent you don't go to court, you save money and you get your money back at the end, and they often have a, a mediation or quasi-mediation process to help you come to mutual agreements and instead of going and litigating the agreements in court. So if you want to find out more about that, just Google collaborative law. If you want to find law practices in your area, I'm sure there are some, just type in your zip code or your city and collaborative law, and you can get a consult and go talk to those people about how that might be beneficial to you. I think it lowers hostility in a lot of cases. I've seen this directly, and I think as a concept, there's a reason to believe that collaborative law makes it less likely that you're going to push the biggest button in your other parent's brain too much and degrade the quality of your co-parenting relationship, okay? But just remember, even if you think you're right, even if your goal is golden, um, sitting in court and impeaching the other parent as unfit is going to push the biggest button in their brain, right? Because there's just not much in my life that can make me more riled up than something threatening the safety or well-being of my child or my relationship with her. There just there's not a lot that rises to that level of button pushing. And, and even if you think you're right, it doesn't get you off the hook for the fact that your, your kid's other parent also is going to get their buttons pushed in the same way, right? It doesn't matter if you're right. You could be wrong and still get that button pushed, right? So, so, so that's something to consider in terms of interfacing with the legal process. Again, get good legal advice from an attorney. Consider collaborative law. At least consider mediation. But when you're wanting to do battle in court, think about the cost to you, not just in dollars and time, but the emotional cost in terms of potential damage to your co parenting relationship as you're making the wisest choice that you can about whether to try to litigate a disagreement. Okay. So that's my two cents worth or 10 cents worth, maybe at this point, on that topic. And stay tuned in this playlist because I've got more videos coming. If you like this video, like hit the, hit the like button below. If you're yet to subscribe, subscribe. Please comment below, but don't flame your ex in the comment. And feel free to share this video if you have a friend or family member who you think would benefit from it. Stay tuned to the sequence. And if you want to check out the whole playlist, I'll put a link in the description below. See you soon.